I welcome you to our leaders uh, session tonight in Jesus name and I pray that the Lord will open our eyes to see what he has for us in the Word of God the Lord will bless you and he'll make you a channel of blessing to multiplied souls in Jesus name let's have the word of prayer together father we thank you tonight we bless your name for your goodness we thank you because you're always there for us and you always meet our needs i pray lord that tonight in a very special way open our eyes to see what you have for us in your word in jesus name and lord we pray that you'll transform our fellowship together. Energize us as we fellowship together. Do great and mighty things through your servants in Jesus' name. We receive the answer. And we know it's going to be for the growth of the body of Christ. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. We're coming to First John tonight. And we're looking at verses 1 to 10. But I'll read verses 1 to 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested. And we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that she may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. In verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we we'll lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. <clears throat> and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You'll notice that in this brief passage we have read, the word fellowship appears four times. In such a brief chapter, mentioning fellowship, over and over makes us to understand that fellowship is important. This great chapter brings us to an indispensable experience of the Christian life. The word fellowship in the original means communion, association, interaction, friendliness, love, helping one another. And so as we're talking about the fellowship, looking at the verses we have read already, it talks about fellowship with the Father, fellowship with God. That's possible. The fellowship was lost in Adam. Christ has come to restore that fellowship. Number one, fellowship with the Father. Number two, fellowship with our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He calls us to fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. If He has gone through such agony and He has made the atonement and He has paid the price for salvation, obviously we cannot turn our backs against Him we will love him, we will fellowship with him, we will commune with him. The apostle also talks about 
our fellowship with the early apostles. It says, it's writing this to us so that we can have fellowship with the apostles, fellowship with us, us there referring to the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ in the early church. But it goes beyond that and it talks about fellowship with other believers. And it says we should have fellowship one with another. And then it talks about fellowship with brethren in the local church. If you cannot fellowship with the people in your local church, how can you fellowship with people far away in foreign lands that you have not seen? And eventually, as we talk about fellowship, you'll come to the fellowship in the local family, in the unit of the family. And so the fellowship we're talking about is extensive. And it reaches out to the very next person with you. But we need to note something. We have read in James chapter 2, verse 17, verse 20, and verse 26, that faith without works is dead. The works there means corresponding action. Faith without expression. Faith without action is dead. We also have read in 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, that our love should not be in words only. That means again, love without action. Love without service, love without help is useless, is worthless. The same thing we say about fellowship. Fellowship cannot be in isolation. Fellowship without action, that's worthless. Fellowship without affection, I'm fellowshipping with him, I'm fellowshipping with her, but there is no affection. That also is useless. Fellowship without agreement. If you're in fellowship with somebody, there's an agreement. Two cannot work together except they be agreed. And so fellowship will bring in action, appropriate action. Fellowship will bring in affection, affection that expresses the fellowship. And fellowship will bring in agreement. There's no fellowship without assistance. You see that the person, the brother, the sister, the minister has a need, and then you turn the other way. There's no fellowship there. Fellowship without assistance is worthless. Fellowship without admonition. He needs admonition. He needs enlightenment. He needs his eyes to be open. He's making a mistake. Is doing something wrong because he doesn't know better. Fellowship without admonition is worthless. Fellowship without association. You see, there are people who say fellowship, fellowship, and there is no association. There is no connection. And there is no touching of the life of the other person. Fellowship without association is meaningless. Fellowship without advance. If you are in fellowship with me, I'm in fellowship with you, you will advance my life, I will advance your ministry. Because as iron sharpens iron, we make ourselves better in the way that we are trading. Let's understand then that as we talk about fellowship, there's no fellowship without action. There's no fellowship without affection. There's no fellowship without agreement. There's no fellowship without assistance. There's no fellowship without admonition. There's no fellowship without association. There's no fellowship without advance. If we're in true fellowship, the fellowship will move us forward and we will advance. Our fellowship will not be unfruitful. Our fellowship will not be unproductive. Our fellowship will not be unprofitable in Jesus' name. 
Tonight, we're looking at the message, the privilege, and possibilities of meaningful fellowship with God. Underline that word, meaningful, not just fellowship. The fellowship has to carry the right meaning. And the fellowship has to lead us to the true understanding of fellowship. The privilege and possibilities of meaningful fellowship with God. We're dividing the chapter, that is the chapter we're looking at, we're dividing into three parts. Number one, the priority of true fellowship with God. The priority of true fellowship with God. Point number two, the possibilities of transparent fellowship among the godly. There's no secrecy in real fellowship, and there is no hiding from one another in real fellowship. There is no covering up. We're open, we're frank, we're transparent. If it is real fellowship, the possibilities of transparent fellowship among the godly. Point number three, our purity and total freedom by his grace our purity and total freedom by his grace let's come back to number one the priority of true fellowship with god since adam fell and the whole race of humanity fell with adam because an unclean couple cannot bring forth a clean offspring. And we all sinned, we came into this world as sinners. And God is holy. God is righteous. God is high. And God is a perfect God. Sin cannot have fellowship with a holy God. And so sinners, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sinners cannot have fellowship with God in the real sense. That's why Christ came. That's why he died. There had been a God, a chasm, a great separation, a great river, uncrossable between the holy God and the sinful man. And Christ came so he can be the bridge between man and God, between the sinner and the holy God. And so he shed his blood. And so he paid the price. And whoever wants to have fellowship with God now will have to go through Jesus Christ because he is the bridge by which the sinner can cross over unto a holy God. And it is Christ that provides forgiveness, provides salvation, provides the atonement, provides redemption, and it provides, that's an important word, reconciliation. Reconciliation with God. And that now brings us into fellowship with God. Fellowship with God should be a priority because it's something that no man could have achieved by himself. Fellowship with God is fellowship with the Creator, is fellowship with the Almighty, is fellowship with the Eternal King. Fellowship with God is fellowship with the Judge of the whole earth. And think about it. You are an intimate fellowship of the judge of the whole earth, that means you'll pass over judgment. If you are not in fellowship with him, you are not in love with him, you are not in friendliness with him, and you are not in intimacy with him, when you come to the judgment on the final day, you are lost. And there's no defense at that time. And so that's why you make it a priority in your life that you are in fellowship with the judge of the whole earth. Fellowship with God is fellowship with the giver of life, giver of eternal life, giver of abundant life, 
giver of spiritual life. Fellowship with God is fellowship with the fountain of all goodness. If you want to experience goodness in life, goodness in your personal life, goodness in your professional life, goodness in your spiritual life, God is the fountain of life. And fellowship with God brings you into intimate relationship with the God of all goodness. That's why it should be our priority. No one should live another day on earth without this fellowship. But there is some crossable gulf between the holy God and a sinful man can only be crossed through the atonement of Christ. He is the one that brings us into fellowship with God. To start what you understand, the word fellowship means agreement. And two cannot work together except they be agreed. God says he is holy. You must agree with that. God says man is sinful. You must agree with that. God says light cannot fellowship with darkness. You must agree with that. God says he is light and you are darkness. And because of that, you, in your natural strength, you, in your natural existence, cannot be in fellowship with the light. You must agree with that. But he says the way is open. I've sent my only begotten son so that he can bring you into fellowship with me. And he is the only way, the only avenue, the only connection between sinful man and the holy God. You must agree with that. If you think of another way, works of your hand. If you think of another way, human religion. If you think of another way, tradition, then you are not in agreement with God. He says, this is my begotten son. And you must hear him. Salvation comes through him. If you don't agree with that, there's no way you can come into fellowship with God. Now, if you agree with that, you will turn away from sin. You will repent. And you will turn to the Lord and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then all sins will be washed away. I said all sins will be washed away. If the Son therefore shall make you free, tell me the rest. You shall be free indeed. You accept God's love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's how you come into fellowship. Let's look at that verse 3 again. First John chapter 1 verse 3. That which we have seen. John is seen. This is no theory. <clears throat> John is seen. This is not hearsay. John is seen. This is not somebody told me. Somebody said it. Somebody convinced me. He said that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. Then it goes on to say, and truly, and realistically, and practically, truly our fellowship is with the Father, where we reconciled unto the Holy God and with the Son Jesus Christ. That's a restoration of what happened originally. That Adam lost, that Eve lost. We're coming to Genesis chapter 3 and I'm reading here from verse 8. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. Let's look at the original fellowship. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 8, and they heard Adam and Eve and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That's fellowship. God came down from heaven so he could fellowship with the man and the woman that he had made in his own image. 
similar nature, similar image and likeness. And because of that similarity, they could fellowship together. But now Adam had fallen. You know the story. But a man eventually came up. Look at Genesis chapter 5. And I'm reading from verse 22. He made his way right with God. He turned away from sin. And he had the redemption and reconciliation with God. And the Bible says this man walked with God. Genesis chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 22. And Enoch walked with God. You know, walking in is a continuous thing. Day by day, week after week, and month after month. Fellowship is a relationship. And it is not a kind of uh, an event of a moment full stop. No, you cannot say I was baptized as an infant and at that time I had fellowship with God. And since that time, I don't even think I read the Bible. And I don't think I listen to there's no fellowship. It's not a momentary thing. It's not just a one event thing. Walking with God, agreeing with God, living with God, loving God is a continuous thing, relationship. Verse 22, and Enoch walked with God after he began Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God continually. Enoch walked with God. There was no time of the 300 years he said, Lord, I don't agree with that. What you have said, what you are telling me, what you are revealing to me, I don't agree with that. There's no walking with God if there's no agreement with him. But Enoch walked consistently and constantly and continuously with God in agreement with everything God said, in agreement with everything God did, in agreement with everything God demanded, and he walked in obedience and faith with God continually. In fact, the fellowship was so much. Have you had the experience uh, you came to somebody's house, and then while you are leaving, you are walking together, and you're still talking. And the fellowship is so rich, and the fellowship is uh, so interesting. You keep on walking and talking, walking and talking, until you reach the house of the other person. And he says, well, looks like uh, we shouldn't be separated. Why don't you stay here tonight? And then you stay there that night. That's how Enoch went to heaven. He was walking with God. And the death penalty that hung on man was removed from him because it says and it was not for God took him that's fellowship you were looking at Genesis chapter 18 in Genesis chapter 18 the priority of true fellowship with God we're reading from verse 17 Genesis chapter 18 verse 17 and the Lord said Shall I hide from Abraham that sin which I do? That's fellowship. There's no secrecy. There's no hiding. I want to do something. He must not hear this one. That's no fellowship. I'm planning something. He must not know this. That's no fellowship. I want to do something. He will not agree with this. So why bother him? Why tell him? That's no fellowship. The fellowship people think they have is a fellowship of a make-believe, hide and seek. They are not open to each other. But fellowship with God means that God is open to us and we are open to God. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do seen, that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him for i know that he 
will command his children and his household after him that they may keep the way of the Lord. That's fellowship. When you have fellowship with God, your children, your family, you tell them, I'm in love with God. I'm in fellowship with God. I'm in intimate relationship with God. If you claim to be my child, you must love the God I love. You must serve the God I serve. The same thing with human relationship, with godly relationship. If we are children of God and we love one another, we'll not be warning our children, understand, I love so-and-so, I'm in fellowship with so-and-so, but don't follow me. Stay where you are. Don't be in fellowship with him. No. Fellowship does not set back wire fence around our family, around our loved ones, and then we'll say, you must not get into this. I fence you around. I'm going now in fellowship with any or so and so, but you are not supposed to be in the same fellowship. No. Fellowship means that you and your family and your loved ones, you're in fellowship. My children are in fellowship with you. Your children are in fellowship with me. We're in fellowship together. That's what fellowship means. But there's hide and seek. I keep what belongs to me. I only want to use what belongs to you. That's no fellowship. It says, for I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, that they will keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Fellowship fulfills promises. God had promised Abraham and they were in fellowship together. And he says, because of that fellowship, I'm going to fulfill all the promises I made unto Abraham. And then the Lord told him about Sodom and Gomorrah. And God didn't say, Abraham, I just told you. This is my prerogative. This is my area. Don't talk about it. I just give you information. That's restriction. That's limitation. There's no fellowship there. But after God gave Abraham the information, he said, God, don't go away yet. Let's talk about it. Let's talk together. That's fellowship. Let's drop minds together. That's fellowship. Suppose you find 50 people there. Will you spare them? Abraham, that's right. If I find 50, I'll spare them. Don't go yet, Lord. How about 40? How about 30? How about 20? What if you find 10 people there? Will you still spare them? Yes, Abraham, I will spare them. And then they went their ways. Fellowship makes us talk together. Fellowship makes us look at our decisions together. Fellowship makes us interact together. I want to do this. You have any comment? You have any admonition? You have any advice? You have any suggestion? You have anything we can do to make this work? That's fellowship. But the fellowship that is, uh, you know, just isolated, and we never talk together, and we never rub minds together, that's no fellowship. Numbers. I'm reading from chapter 12. Numbers. Chapter 12. And we're reading from verse 7. Numbers chapter 12, verse 7 and verse 8. Look at what it says. With him will I speak, verse 7, my servant Moses is not so. Who is faithful in all mine house? With him will I speak mouth to mouth. With him will I speak mouth to mouth. That's fellowship with God. And that's fellowship with one another. Even apparently. And not in that speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. The similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Let's come back to Exodus chapter 33. 
And I'm reading from verse 11. Understand the life of hide and seek is not fellowship. The life of holding back what I have from my so-called friend, that's not fellowship. And the life of eating all my food alone, and I must eat before my friend comes in, that's no fellowship. Fellowship means sharing. Fellowship means communion. Fellowship means that everything I have, I expose to you. Exodus chapter 33. And we're reading from verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. As a man speaketh unto his friend. I want to remind you that God is higher than man, higher than Abraham, higher than Moses, higher than Enoch by far. And yet, no superiority or inferiority. In fellowship, there's no superiority. I'm greater than you are. I'm higher than you are. I know more than you are. I'm not in the same class with you. My class is up there. I feel superior. There's no fellowship there. And there's no inferiority complex in fellowship. I'm nobody. Well, Abraham said, I am dust and ashes. But all the same, God had fellowship with Abraham. And look at Moses that said, I cannot talk. I'm a stammerer. And even since you spoke to me, I cannot talk well. And God still had fellowship with him. In fellowship, there's no demarcation. In fellowship, there is no putting somebody down. In fellowship, there's no being far away that I cannot relate with you or you cannot relate with me. I pray God will make us understand fellowship. Make us practice fellowship. Did you hear that kind of amen? Yeah. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'm reading here from verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers actually. There's no way that a real believer can be in fellowship with an unbeliever. If you understand what fellowship means. He is thinking of darkness, you are thinking of light. He is thinking of occultism, you are thinking of the power of Christ at Calvary. He is thinking of how to cheat other people, and you are thinking of how to give to other people. There's no way you can be in fellowship together. It, that's why it says, be not unequally yoked together with some believers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Of what part I see that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement? Remember, if there's going to be fellowship, there'll be agreement. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. How do we then come into fellowship with God, intimate relationship with God, unbroken reconciliation with God? Verse 17, wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Amen. Amen. If we're in agreement with God, God says, come out. Lord, I agree. I come out. He says, touch not the unclean thing. Lord, I agree. I will not touch the unclean thing. I will not do it in secret. As if God is blind. He cannot see what we do in secret. But we do what he has said 
we will not touch on clean things in Jesus name somebody shout amen. amen point number two now the possibilities of transparent fellowship among the godly we're looking at first John first John chapter 1 and I'm reading from verse 4 all through to verse 7 first John chapter 1 verse 4 and these things write we unto you that is we're writing to you concerning fellowship that you come into fellowship with us come into fellowship with the father and with the son these things were right unto you that your joy may be full as you come into fellowship with god your joy will be full as you come into fellowship with people of like precious faith your joy will be full think about it when you're in fellowship and this one is helping and that one is praying and that one is interceding and this one is advising and that one is admonishing you every lack of your life will be supplied in jesus name this then is the message we have heard of him and declare unto you that god is light and in him is no darkness at all because there's no darkness at all in him verse 6 if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth he is light if we're going to be in fellowship with him we must be in the light light of love of knowledge of deeds of goodness not seeing evil that we do behind the closed door and if we're in fellowship with him he's always light every moment every time from all eternity he has always been light and if we now come into fellowship with him we cannot live in darkness if we say if we profess empty testimony empty profession empty confession empty declaration if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth but if we walk in the light god will delight in us as he is in the light notice that word as 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 he is in the light not today in the light tomorrow in darkness not undulating not up and down not secret behavior that associates us with satan and then we come to church on sunday and say praise the lord hallelujah isn't god great and wonderful that's hypocrisy the lord is in the light on monday on tuesday on wednesday thursday friday saturday sunday not only on sunday for him light is the nature of his life and so if anyone says he's strong on sunday he's weak on weekdays is in the light on the sunny day sunday and then he is in darkness throughout the week that's no fellowship with God. God is always in the light. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. You're walking in the light. I'm walking in the light. We have fellowship one with another. You love God. I love God. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanseth us from, tell me, tell me out aloud, all sin, transparency in true fellowship. Transparency is the mark of real fellowship truthfulness that's the mark of real fellowship honesty there's no dishonesty in real fellowship there's honesty sincerity that's real fellowship mutual trust 
I trust you. I'm not looking over your shoulders. I trust you. I'm not suspecting you. You trust me. You are not suspecting me. There's fellowship. But while we are saying we're in fellowship and we're watching each other, I don't know what he's going to bring out of the pocket. I don't know what's going to, what he's going to say next. I don't know what he might come out with. And therefore, I'm suspicious. That's no fellowship. That's no transparent fellowship. But in real fellowship, there is no shadow of the slightest darkness at all. We have fellowship with one another. There's no real fellowship if there is no transparency. In sincerity, it is so called fellowship is a ploy to use other people for our selfish gain. We pretend fellowship. We act as if we're in fellowship because we want to use him, abuse him. I want to take something from him while he's not watching. That's why they say sincerity in so-called fellowship, in the fellowship of members of the body of Christ. Each one has something to contribute. In the fellowship of the members of the body of Christ, each one has something to contribute. The one fellowship is not one-sided. It's not, I get, I take, I hold, I claim. No. You get, you give. You receive, you also declare, give to other people. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 I'm reading from verse 18. But now, as God said, members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him, as it has pleased him, the fingers are not of the same shape and the same length. They're different, but in fellowship together to hold anything, to carry anything, they are in fellowship together. The legs, uh, the feet are different from the arms, and they are not of the same function. The hand specializes in this, and the legs specialize in that, but in fellowship together, and there's no contradiction among them. The ears and the eyes are different, and yet, they fellowship together and they work together to move the body forward. Members of the body of Christ, as they have different functions and different approaches and they have different emphasis, yet if they are members of the body of Christ, there is fellowship among them and they unite together to move the body forward. Look at First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is he therefore not of the body because of the difference between the foot and the, uh, and the hand? I'm not of the body. I cannot do what they're doing. I cannot say what they're saying. I cannot dot every I and cross every T of theirs because of that I'm not of the body. No, we have different functions and yet we're united together, understand, to move the body forward. Look at verse 16. And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where were the smelling? But now God has said, members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members and different members? And it says, 
yet they are one body. The church is one. I said the church is one. Members are different. Denominations are different. But if we know Christ, if we believe in Christ, if Christ has atoned for our sins and we have believed on him and he has linked us up with the Heavenly Father, we are one in Jesus' name. Verse 21, the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be feeble are more necessary. Don't disqualify yourself and don't say, I cannot be. If you're a member of the body of Christ, we're in fellowship. I said we're in fellowship. And that fellowship will be productive in every life in Jesus' name. Now, in fellowship, as we have read from the word of God, every member of the body has something to contribute to the body to move that body forward. In fellowship, you feed some hungry soul. You can feed them with food. You can feed them with the word of life. But in fellowship, you feed some hungry soul. In fellowship, you ease someone's body. Someone's body is carrying a load that is too heavy for him. And in fellowship, if you feed some hungry soul, e in fellowship, you ease someone's body. L, you lend a hand. Lend a hand. Can I help you? Can I carry that with you? I'm available. I'm not carrying any other thing. Can I share that problem with you? Lend a hand. That's fellowship. In fellowship, lead the falling. Don't trample on them. Lead the falling. Don't make jest of them. Lead the falling. That's why when the fellowship, two are better than one. So that if one falls, the other will lift him up. In fellowship, offer some help. You are struggling. Can I offer you some help? I went through that before too. I faced that challenge before. Can I help you and offer the solution I got when I was in a similar problem? Offer some help. In fellowship, double you now, wake up. They look warm. Somebody is tired. Somebody is weary. Somebody is giving up. Somebody is saying, I cannot move on again. Somebody is thrown in the toil. And somebody is saying, I didn't know it would be like this. I'm tired. Somebody is considering ending his life. Wake up. They look warm. And show them. We're not at the end of the road yet. Tomorrow will be better than today. I didn't hear your amen. Speak as, speak a word to the weary. Speak a word to the confused. Speak a word to somebody at a crossroad. Age, heal a hurt. Heal a hurt. With sweet word. With sympathetic word, heal a hurt. I influence someone to be a better person. Maybe it's good already, influence them to be better. Maybe it's going at a normal speed, influence him to go faster. Maybe he's successful, but influence him to be more successful. Influence someone. To be better and pee pour out your life into an empty vessel there's somebody feeling empty pour out your life pour out your love 
put your resources, put everything you've got into that life, refresh other people's lives, renew other people's lives, lift up other people's lives. Don't allow people you know, believers you know, to remain stagnant at the same level. Pour out your life to an empty vessel. That, my brother, my sister, is true fellowship. That, my brother, my sister, is transparent fellowship. That's sincere fellowship. That's meaningful fellowship. What's the possibility if we do that? What's the possibility? What will happen if we do that? Well, number one, look at this in John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And I'm reading here from verse 11. In John chapter 15, verse 11, these things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Fellowship is always looking for what can I do to make him happy? What can I do to make him joyful? What can I do to make him successful? What can I do to make him have more of what he has got already? This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you greater love as no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Lord Jesus, do you mean that Peter is your friend? And you told him the other day, get thee behind me, Satan. He said, yes, he's still my friend. I corrected him because I love him. He wasn't saying the right thing, so I corrected him. And you will notice that after that correction, in the next chapter, I took him to the Mount of Transfiguration. I've forgiven him, and I've forgotten what he has done. And because of fellowship, we move on. We are friends. Jesus called his disciples friends. That means that if we are pastors, and we are members of the church, and we're in fellowship with members of the church, we're friends. We relate with the members of the church like we are friends. I about fellow ministers. We relate like we are friends. And look at verse 14. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever, I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants. Henceforth, I call you not slaves. Henceforth, I call you not inferior people. Henceforth, I'm not looking down on you. For the servant knoweth not what is not doing. But I have called you friends. The Lord is calling you friend. I said the Lord is calling you friend. So all the fear, all the misgiving in your heart. I was this, I was this. And therefore, maybe he'll jump on me, pounce on me, and crush me. It's your friend. He will help you. For all things that I've heard of my father have I made known unto you. You see that? You see that all things that I have heard of my father I have made known unto you. I want you, look, you to look at John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Here is fellowship. And here is the expectation of the Lord. In John chapter 17, and I'm reading here from verse 11. John 17 verse 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep them through thine own name, those whom you have, whom thou hast given me, that they may be one, notice this, as we are one, as we are one. But don't forget, Christ, the light of the world, God also is light. And because these disciples had become light, ye are the light of the world. Light, Christ, light, God, the disciples, light of the world, one. 
as we are one. If they had remained in their sin, if they were adamant in their sin, it will not say, make them one like we are one. There's no sin in Christ. There is no sin in God the Father. And because they are similar, they are like themselves. It says, as we are one, make them one. Look at chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 21. That they all may be one. They all saved. They all washed. They all cleansed. They all who have turned from darkness and they have come to light. It says that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me. Father, art in me. And I in thee. Anything different from that is a union. A union may have different members and there's no unity. But the real unity Christ was talking about, I in you and you in me, it says that they also may be one in us. May be one in us. If any of those people went to Satan, went to occultism, and remain in occultism and a satanic affiliation. That individual cannot be one with Christ or with God. The oneness is talking about is that you come out of sin, I come out of sin, we come out of sin, and we're worshiping God in sincerity, and we love him, we're in the light, and he is in the light. We will be one. I said we will be one. What's the result? Verse 21, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. That the world may believe. That's the result. I pray that the world around us, when they see us loving each other, when they see us walking together, when they see us in transparent lifestyle, when they see us obeying the word of God together, they will be one to the Lord in Jesus' name. Somebody must say amen. amen. Second Samuel. I'm reading from chapter 10 of Second Samuel, verse 11. Second Samuel, chapter 11. This is the product of transparent fellowship. The product of true fellowship. It says in 2 Samuel chapter 10 verse 11. And he said, If the Syrians be too strong for me, thou shalt help me. You see that? That's fellowship. But look at the other side. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. That's fellowship. That's fellowship. Fellowship is not a one-sided thing. You are in a battle, I'm in a battle. You're a warrior, I'm a warrior. You have some things coming against you, have some things coming against me. And then we come together in fellowship. And here is what we we'll say. If the Syrians be too strong for me, then... You will come and help me. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help you. We'll help each other. We'll lift up each other. We will not trample on each other. We'll lift up each other in Jesus' name. Look at Proverbs chapter 27. Verse 17, Proverbs, chapter 27, and I'm reading from verse 17. This is fellowship. It says in verse 17, iron sharpness iron. I make you better, you make me better. I lift you higher, you lift me higher. I make you more focused, you help me to be more focused. I give you courage, you give me strength, we help each other, iron sharpness iron, so a man's, a man's sharpness the countenance 
of his friend. A man sharpness the countenance of his friend. Let's come back to First John chapter 1. And we're reading now from verse 7 to verse 10. First John chapter 1 verse 7 to verse 10. Our purity and total freedom by his grace. Look at this. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the word is word is not in us. As we look at those verses, you have to keep them together. The Apostle John is consistent with all the scriptures and consistent with Christ. It's consistent with other apostles too that when we are saved, we are set free from sinning. But you know, we come into false interpretation. When we take one verse, isolate that verse, interpret that verse, explain that verse without thinking of the connection with the other verses. Look at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If you take that in isolation, without any connection with verse 7, without any connection with verse 9, you'll misinterpret that verse. You'll be saying every time, I'm a sinner. If I say I have no sin, I deceive myself, and the truth is not in me. Because you take it in isolation. Look at verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. If you take that in isolation, you are going to go off a tangent. You are going to add some other words that are not there. You are going to read it like, if we say we have not sinned today, after all, you might have stepped on an ant, after all, you might have done something unconscious that you didn't know was a sin. And so, if we say we have not sinned today, we make him a liar. Now you've added a word today. It's not there. And you're doing that because you are interpreting it in isolation. Bring everything together now, verse 7. If we walk in the light and as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And somebody says, no, I don't have any sin to be cleansed. That's why verse 8 comes saying, if we say we have no sin to be cleansed, to be washed, to be set free from, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But in verse 9, if we confess our sins, and faith is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, at that time we are free because he has cleansed us but look at verse 10 if we say we have not sinned enoch became a child of god walking with god at the age of 65 
and then from 65 to 365 years, 300 years there, he was walking with God. But he cannot say, I have never sinned. Paul the Apostle said, your witnesses and God also, how holily and justly, unblameably we have walked before you. But he cannot say just because the grace of God has cleansed to him that since I was born into this world, I have not seen. No, he cannot say that. He says, I thank God I'm forgiven. I thank God I am cleansed. I thank God I'm living a victorious life now. But I cannot say I have never seen. He's talking about the fact that before you were saved, you had sinned, and now he has forgiven you. But let's look at John now. Look at the next chapter, chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. You must connect everything with all the verses that John has written. I'm writing this to you so that you will not continue in sin. You will not continue in sin in Jesus' name. Look at this. And if any man sin, he didn't say, and when any man sins, as if it must happen. When it happens, no. It says normally it should not happen. And yet it says if by carelessness, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Come to chapter 3. Chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 8. Chapter 3, verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil seen it from the beginning. John is very clear. We cannot interpret chapter 1 to mean you keep on sinning, you keep on sinning, you keep on sinning. It says he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil seen it from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. He'll destroy the works of the devil. Look at verse 9. Whosoever is born of God, tell me, tell me, say it with assurance, does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. See that. If you take uh, chapter 1, verse 8 in isolation, you'll never realize this. If you take chapter 1 verse 10 in isolation, you'll never come to this. But it says in verse 9, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. You will not sin. Chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 4. Chapter 4 verse 4, ye of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The, the one inside you is greater than the tempter. He will give you victory. All right, he'll give me victory. Look at chapter 4, I'm reading there from verse 17. There is, herein is our love made perfect, that we may be bold in the day of judgment, because as he is without sin, as he is righteous, as he is holy, as he is good, so are we in this world the lord maintain the victory in your life in jesus name look at chapter 5 verse 21 chapter 5 verse 18 verse 18 chapter 5 verse 18 we know that whosoever is born of god tell me sinners not we know that whosoever is born of god whosoever anywhere anytime in any generation, for whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches him not. It will not touch me. I said it will not touch me. 
I said it will not touch me. It will make you victorious in Jesus' name. That's what Christ came to do. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. It will save you from all sin. John chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 11. John chapter 8, verse 11. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Tell me, go and sin no more. We're coming to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Look at verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the laws thereof. Verse 18, being then made free from sin. Made free from sin. It will keep you free. The power to remain free, it will grant to you in Jesus' name. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Verse 22. But now, now, after salvation, now, after knowing the Lord now, after being forgiven, set free, and cleansed from all unrighteousness, but now be made free from sin and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 34. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not. You see that? Awake to righteousness and sin not. We will not continue in sin. The grace of God will multiply in your life. And the strength of the Lord will multiply in your life in Jesus' name. Titus chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. It has appeared unto me. I said it has appeared unto me. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lost. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly. When? I said, when do we live godly? When do we live without sin? In this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from tell me all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works if he has not done it yet he will do it in your life if he has done it already he will strengthen your life in jesus name now in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, 
come and look at it. Behold, gaze at it. Behold, all things are become new. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, I am in Christ. I am in Christ. I've become a new creature. I have become a new creature. I have become a new creature. Old things have passed away in my life. Behold, all things have become new in my life. May the Heavenly Father confirm it in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Remember, He has called us to fellowship. Fellowship with God, fellowship with one another. Fellowship that is expressive and fellowship that will experience and fellowship that will help each other and fellowship that will purge each other and God will give us and make us to maintain the victory all through the rest of our lives in Jesus name. I welcome you to that fellowship. I welcome you to that freedom. I welcome you to that victory. Rise up and become more than a conqueror. More than a conqueror. More than a conqueror. All the things that overcame you before, they will not continue overcoming you. New life has come. New strength has come. New enlightenment has come. Now in fellowship together, we're going to be victorious together. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord before you go.